you so much, Mariana. Okay, so we are almost done with this wonderful conference, which makes me very sad, but uh, very exciting that we have the, the chance to spend the day with all of you wonderful women and men in our audience. So our next and final panel is called Women for Resilience. Adaptations and resilience are integral to achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement. Unless preventative action is taken, climate change generated natural disasters have been estimated to put at risk 1.3 billion people by 2050 and destroyed assets worth 158 million US dollars, billion US dollars, which is double the annual productive output of the world. What cities, in partnerships with the private sector and other actors do to adapt to climate change will determine in large parts what the future will look like for all of us. Luckily, a number of high-quality, capable city leaders and representatives of major global companies are already taking action. So let's hear from our panelists. Please welcome to the stage moderator Adela Micha, journalist at El Financiero Bloomberg, the wonderful Jackie Biskowski, Major of Side Lake City, Tania Müller-Garcia, Secretary of the Environment of Mexico City, Damia Boferrache, Chief of Staff of the Deputy CEO of Suez in Spain, Latin America, and Water France. Thank you. Hola. Hi. Good afternoon. I'm Adela Mita. I'm sorry about the... Let me maybe turn here. <laughs> I'm so glad to host this panel. Thank you so, so much. You've been introduced already, so just uh, let, me, let me just welcome to, to our city one of the C C40s and uh, be you very welcome. Thank you very much, Tania. You're one of the hostess, so thank you. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. And um, so one of the, the, the challenges, I think, uh, of all the big cities is um, water, migration, resilience, and uh, climate impact. So this is about what we're talking this, uh, this afternoon. And uh, I would like to start maybe you, Tanya. Uh, we just uh, went through a very big earthquake in Mexico City. What have we been doing? It's a very big challenge. And how are we preparing for something that could happen again? Well, good afternoon to all. It's a pleasure to be here today. So I think something that has been very important here in Mexico is that in 2016, the mayor presented our resilience strategy, the first in the country. And that resilience strategy is exactly an evaluation of what our weak points are within the city. And without a doubt, uh, water is one of our weak points, something we have to work on. But to have a resilience strategy for Mexico City is exactly the tools that allow us to be prepared for these not only natural disasters and climate change disasters, but any other threat that the city can have. So I think that has been very important. And last year, the mayor made official the Office of Resilience for Mexico City, also the first in the country. So I think this is very important in terms of public policy because it will allow the city to have continuity for the change of the administration. So we have really prioritized resilience, not only with its own office and strategy, but also within our climate action program. So with this strategy, it has helped us, uh, for example, with the earthquake, Adela, we saw that bicycles and the way to mobilize with uh, bicycles and the volunteers was very efficient. So we have really invested in these last six years very uh, strongly in bike infrastructure, just to give an example of how mobility is a key factor when you have a disaster like the one we had or an earthquake on the 19th of September. So, and that's part of our resilience strategy and our climate action program. What about infrastructure? So we've, we've invested in bikeways, in parking lots, in bike schools, in our public bike system. And we see when we have these kind of events, how this non-motorized form of mobility was very efficient to bring uh, first aid, to bring food, to bring water to the different sites 
that needed this help. So this is just an example of what Mexico City is doing. Well, that, that moves me to another question, maybe to Damia. Thank you very much, Damia, for being with us. And uh, well, my question would be, what is West doing to address water shortages all, of, all around the world? I think that's a very big challenge worldwide. Well, um, actually, I would firstly stress the fact that um, fighting climate change has been at the core of today's world's concerns. And the COP21, which resulted in the Paris Agreements, is a good illustration of that. And we at Suez, we are committed to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 30% in 2030. This said, um, indeed, the, the climate change has had a huge impact on water resources. And paradoxically, we have two different phenomena. On the one side, you have areas in the world where, where you have too much water. I'm thinking about recent uh, tremendous uh, events of uh, uh, extreme rainfalls, hurricanes, tsunamis. And we also have areas in the world where, obviously, as you all know, we are lacking water. And if we do not do anything, if we continue on, the, this, uh, in, on this path, by 2025, 40% of the population will live in areas where they will lack water. Uh, this is the diagnosis. What we do at Suez, I will just mention two examples of our solutions. Um, firstly, we um, try to find alternative resources of uh, water, because this is the main issue in areas where, where we lack water. And I will quote the, the ongoing project in this country, uh, in Playas de Rosarito, where we are uh, about to build and operate the, the largest desalination plant in the American continent. Um, this is an example of using a resource that already exists in order to uh, give access to drinking water to a, to, to a huge amount of people. The second example I would quote is um, the prediction of uh, what I would call catastrophe events. Mm -hmm. um, I will um, mention the example of Barcelona where we use the Aqua Advanced Urban Drainage uh, tool which uh, enables us to predict how the network will behave in case of floods of huge rainfalls um, in, in the city. Now, um, Salt Lake City, it's a very beautiful city. Mayor Biskopski is with us. Uh, this afternoon, and uh, well, my obvious question would be, uh, considering you have a lack of leadership uh, regarding climate change in your country right now, in the right. United States, how are you, I don't know, um, let's say, how are you co collaborating between each other regional and locally? Yeah, so Because that's a very big problem right. regarding and the United States. You know, for, for Utah, part of the reason I am here is because our climate is warming at twice the global rate in the state of Utah. This is a significant issue for us as we draw our water from the mountains. So our snowfall has been very minimal this year. So our window of water coming off of the watershed will be minimal this year. So what we have done is we have been doing assessments and we have done uh, climate response planning and we have measured resiliency on transportation and, how, and healthcare and our forestry and partnering with the National Forest Service, partnering with experts from all over the state, from different organizations through an organization called UCAN, which is our Utah Climate Action Network. And together within the state, we are addressing these issues and we are implementing our strategies both within city government and our departments and our divisions, but also community-wide and then across the state. The other kind of silver lining of President Trump being in his position um, is that it has forced the mayors across the country to rise up. And when I signed on Salt Lake City to 100% renewable energy by 2032, I was the 16th mayor to sign on. The Sierra Club 
reached out and asked for me to help drive mayors to this goal. And in one summer, in one U.S. Conference of Mayors, uh, myself and Javier Gonzalez from Santa Fe, we ended up shoring up over 150 mayors. Um, so, and now a year and a half later, we're at over 180 mayors in our country that have agreed to go 100% renewable by 2035. Uh, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> but that's being a very big issue in the country, no? Yes. I mean, how are you going to deal with the president? Yes, very big issue. And so the mayors are rallying, and part of what, what we're doing is planning. For the first time ever, Salt Lake City has a clean energy plan. We have an affordable housing plan. For the first time ever, we have a transit plan. All of this work being done by women who work for me, I will say, yeah, um, half of my cabinet is women, and those women are leading these conversations and driving the agenda. Now three other communities in the state of Utah have also agreed to go 100% renewable. So we are trying to move our entire state in the right direction against all will, the political... Um, mentality is very similar uh, in the United States Capitol as it is in the Utah State Capitol. Yeah. So now that you mentioned women, our, uh, the people here is mainly women. So my, my question is for the three of you. Why women for climate? What are we doing and what do we have to do, women, regarding climate impacts and everything that has to be to do with big cities? Tanya, you want to talk about that or whoever wants to answer first? Um, well, not surprisingly, um, women are the first victims of climate change and, and specifically uh, water scarcity. If we take the example of uh, emerging countries, uh, the, the, the people who are going to fetch the water from the wells, they are girls. And at the same time, they do not go to school. The ones who take care of their kids who are sick, often because of water-related diseases, these are mothers who do not go to work. So we have, the, uh, at Suez, our first responsibility is to, to uh, facilitate the access to drinking water to these populations. But luckily, there's some good news. Um, women are part of the solution, and you can see here today. We are all part of the solution. Um, and for that, we need to empower these women. Um, we have committed in, our, in, in my company to, to have 33% of women in managing position by 2021. Uh, but we are also committed into the training of women in water services locally um, we are trying to uh, show the path and empower them so that women leadership will raise from that and will bring un answers to the, the issue of water scarcity. Mayor Biskowski. Sure. So for me, so much of this has been about bringing women into the conversation and for the first time uh, we have a, a woman running our public utilities department and the expertise that comes with her and her collaboration with Vicki Bennett to help create this document, which is also online. Vicki Bennett is running my Department of Sustainability and women are collaborative and, and we care and we're very focused. We've been watching what's happening and we've been saying, why are we sitting back? This is not going the way it needs to be going. And so we're rising up across the world and we're saying, let us help navigate this. Um, I had a female uh, director who just retired from my airport, but due to her experience and her expertise, we are building a brand new international airport that will be net zero, right? How exciting wow. is that? And we are, we are on track, we will open in 2020 and we are on track to meet that goal. So very exciting things happening and when you bring the expertise to the table, 
the beauty of it all unfolds naturally and, and we have the opportunity to move in new directions. I brought in uh, Dr. Jennifer Selig to run my community empowerment team. And there is a very diverse team. They speak many languages and they are going into our communities and reaching out to hear what those needs are so that we can help bring resources into parts of our community where there are minorities or, or women, single mothers who are oppressed. We are finally understanding all the dynamics of our city in a way that we haven't been able to do before because of the work of Dr. Selig and her team. Wow. Well, we're majority here, but we're treated still like minorities. So, Tanya, maybe Secretary Mueller, you want to talk about That's that? That's true. And it's no secret that women are, we are more vulnerable to any climate change effects. So I think that's why it's so important to empower women. And Mexico City, since the beginning, in our Climate Action Program 2014-2020, we envisioned our Climate Action Program with a gender vision. With a, we have 102 actions and 78 are gender responsive because we know the importance not only of preparing as a city and our communities, but also the importance to empower women. And I think that's why it has been so important, this mentorship program. And for the first time in the administration, in the Ministry of Environment, we have a 50-50 balance in the administration of general directors who are women. And I would like to thank them because everything we have done the general director of zoos, of air quality, of urban parks, they have done such an amazing job and really for the first time in the ministry, we have more women working at higher levels in positions where they do have to take decisions and make a difference and I think that has been fundamental. No, so um, we can really show the empowerment of women and how effective we are and how we can change the cities, our public policies, our communities, when we engage and we can do it. It is possible. Now, are we aware of that, Secretary Mueller? I mean, women, everybody here, what can we do? I mean, well, I from, think from this, our, this from Congress our... has been so inspiring. And when we see the mentees that are in the, in, the, in the Women for Climate program and how innovative their programs are and how young, the range of the mentees in Mexico City is between 23 and 28 years old. So we see that there are very young women who are aware that we have to do something, we have to take action. So I think that has been fundamental, no? And yes, I think the new generations are aware that are more empowered. There is still a long way to go, but I think obviously these kind of Congresses and being a part of C40 helps us give visibility to women, to what we are capable to do, and that we can do it, and that's what we're working on. Let me, let me ask you three, the three of you this. You were talking maybe about expertise. I would say one of women's expertise is resilience. <laughs> no yes. doubt about it. Yeah. <laughs> I oh, think so. I got a story <laughs> for you. <laughs> I, I, I truly believe that. Yes. I don't know if you agree, the three of you, and maybe this is why we're talking about yes. this in this plan. Absolutely. You know, um, when I ran for office to become the mayor, um, I was running against a popular incumbent, and you cannot wait to be invited to the table, and you must lead the conversations when you get there. Uh, those are two very important things that I had to learn through the school of hard knocks when I was a legislator for 13 years on Capitol Hill. And, and, and what I know is I have the expertise and the ability to bring people together in a way that um, it doesn't push people out of the conversation but brings them in. And it's so important. Uh, to not just bring women, but to keep the men who are the experts, who are our partners, who are wanting us to succeed, and who are shining a bright light on us uh, whenever possible. So as female leaders, um, please continue to mentor one another and don't grab each other's ankles. Lift each other up. There's enough ankle grabbing going on without us doing it for the men that we are working with. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you. It's a universal bravo. Damia. 
Well, I think what, what Mayor Biskopski just uh, put on the table is also the, the issue of collaborating in a wider way. I mean, we cannot continue um, working in silos, private companies on our side, public uh, local authorities on the other, citizens, uh, I don't know, NGOs, startups. We've seen great startups um, this morning. I think in order to, to make it resilient, we need to work more together, to break walls, uh, to collaborate more. We all have an interest in working together. Otherwise, we are just going to in the middle of the wall. Tanya. Without a doubt, I, I am convinced that women, we are much more resilient to adversity because in our day-to-day -day life, obviously all the activities that women do professionally at home is a much greater challenge. You know, the, the roles here still of gender, men normally just go to work and attend work, but leave the household behind. And women have to combine all of these activities together. So when we talk about resilience and how to move forward and how many women in Latin America especially are the heads of households alone, you see how strong women are and how resilient they are. And I think that is a huge opportunity. We just have to acknowledge that. We have to recognize that resilience and that strength within, within us and that we are drivers of change, that we do implement change in our households, in our communities, and to realize what strong leaders women are. And um, well, Adela, you're a, you're a great example as well, one of the great journalists in the country <laughs> and opinion leaders. Well, example of so, resilience. <laughs> Thank you so, very much. Um, I think that is a, a great asset that we have. We just have to acknowledge it much more. And we have to transmit that to the newer generations also. Now, Mexico City, it's a huge city. It's a beautiful, I love this city. Uh, th this is your first time here, Mayor, right? Yes. Yeah. And just for hours? I mean, you just yes, got here? Uh, just a little over 24 hours. Oh, it's an amazing city. Yes. It's beautiful. You've been here before. This is your yeah, third this time. This is my third time. How, how do you find us? How do you oh, find us? I love, this city? I love this city. Unfortunately, I just arrived at 4 a.m. this morning and I didn't have the time to enjoy anything, <laughs> yeah, but I, I know. love it. I know. But it's a beautiful city, but it has a lot of challenges. And many times you have to take decisions that are not very popular here in the city, in, with the, within the citizens, Tanya, regarding our, our issue here, which is climate. Uh -huh. Just keep it, just keep it open. <laughs> climate change and obviously air quality is one of our greater challenges with mobility and that affect uh, women, you know, mobility, air quality, health. So yes, as, as public servants, it's sometimes we have to take those, and mayors, we have to take those hard decisions that they're not popular, but that we know that in the medium and long run, they will be beneficial for the people. Uh, restriction, restrictions, for example, on driving your cars, no, or so many other things that we have to regulate. We have to be conscious. No, nobody likes to be regulated. Nobody likes to have uh, surveillance, environmental surveillance, much less and uh, nobody likes to be fined when you're not doing something correctly. But these are three aspects that we have to do within the government, within a governance. I think the key factor is also how do you communicate that to the citizens, to the constituents, to really bring forward and have consciousness that the actions and decisions that we make are planned for the medium and long term to improve the quality of life of all of us especially in, in great cities and mega cities like Mexico City, where we have so many challenges environmentally and socially. But that's what we're working and on. And how are, how are we doing, I mean, regarding that, like citizens? Do we, are we conscious about the, the, what are we dealing with? Well, there's, I think definitely there's always more, there's more consciousness of the importance of the environment and taking care of the environment and citizens are much more engaged and they want more information of what we're doing as uh, on the side of the government, how we're doing it, have information and transparency. I think transparency is a key factor. All over. Yeah, All I over. agree. Yeah. All over. I agree. Regarding water, uh, Damia, what can we do? I mean, just uh, like uh, one like one of us, you know, what can we do? It's a very big issue, again, worldwide. And it's you mean absurd. at the citizen level? 
yeah, yeah, to contribute to that. Well, I, I won't, I won't make a lecture of the do's and don'ts, the uh, like take a shower, not a bath. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that when you brush your teeth, you have to turn off the the tap. That's obvious. I think we should have a more demanding behavior. We have the right as citizens, and I'm speaking as a citizen now, we have the right to be more demanding regarding the public authorities, regarding um, the private companies, the, the, the goods we are consuming. Um, earlier before we saw this great lady presenting her, her project of a, a patent um, of environmental pattern for restaurants in France, I think we have the right to demand um, the, the, the companies we consume the products um, to, to have a, a more responsible behavior, not only in terms of water scarcity and, and environmental protection, but also in, in terms of, of uh, consideration towards women. Um, we should stop acting like we are only a black hole consuming whatever comes and start taking our own fate in our hands. Uh, and really, I, th I think being demanding is quite a good first step. Our, our, our voices are being heard, Mayor. Women you know, and minorities. Yes, so, in, yes, in some ways. Um, it's very difficult in the state of Utah. Right now, Salt Lake City is battling with the state as they are in session, wanting to take away our water rights. We deliver water to about a million people, even though my community is only 200,000. But that responsibility weighs heavy on us, and we have some of the cleanest water and best tasting water in the country, and that's real, and that's because of how we manage our watershed. And now we have to battle our own government uh, to keep them from developing in the watershed and to keep them from wanting to um, divert the control of how the watershed is managed to people that don't know really what they're doing. So for us, the battle is still kind of high level. And we're working uh, with our community empowerment team to do outreach, I budgeted $200,000 so that we could do outreach and get a better understanding of the needs of uh, our minority population. Um, and, and now we'll have a chance to bring resources to bear through our energy provider like Rocky Mountain Power um, on some of the research that we've done. But the water piece of this, um, we have programs. We're going into people's homes and helping them upgrade um, some of their, um, even their faucets and their shower heads so that their much lower usage is happening. Um, but we have a ways to go. Secretary, what about Mexico, Mexico City? Well, I think one of Mexico City's um, issues, without a doubt, is water. Uh, however, there's a huge way that we still have to go. If you consider that in Mexico City, the average consumption of all of us is an average 350 liters per person, when in, a, in Latin America, it's 150 liters per person, what is happening? Mexico City has one of the lowest rates for water consumption. So there is absolutely no incentive to save water or to be much more conscious of how we use water. So without a doubt, it, when you see uh, countries in Europe or in North America where the cost for water is much, much higher, of course, there's a huge incentive to be very efficient with our water use domestically and at the industrial level. So what we do have to do, and I'm convinced, is we have to increment the water of cost in Mexico City, obviously taking into consideration the social aspect of those who don't have as much access to water. But today, those who don't have water are paying the highest rates. Why? Because they are buying water. And obviously, here is where women come into the picture again. That's the irony, no? That's no, the part, that's yeah. the irony. They are the most affected, the ones who are paying the most. But what is the problem? Every time we want to talk about water costs, it is pol politically 
turned around so that the costs remain the same. So that is something that is a depth that we have with the city, and I think it's something we do have to attend urgently. It's urgent. It's not it's only important, urgent. it's urgent. So what we are doing is uh, a lot of communication and education within the households and the citizens to be much more conscious of our water use. I don't know if that's alarmist because we're running out of time, but <laughs> I'm not sure though. But I would like to ask you uh, one last question to the three of you again. I mean, I think the achievements are important, the, the, what, what you've achieved but the challenges are also huge. So if you just to, I mean, to close, so, to close yeah, the panel. So for it, closing, I could start. Um, right now, because of the lack of snowfall uh, during the months of December and January, we're already looking at um, what do we do to make sure that we have enough water throughout the year. Um, our water will come off the mountain much quicker this spring and, and there will be less of it. So our reservoirs are full, but we're also looking at, you know, do we utilize our aquifers and then how much energy will it take to get that water back out of the aquifers and all of that is being evaluated, but things like this have to happen. Conservation will be launched in March for us. We will send out messages about, you know, really conserving on your usage and helping our community understand that we are in the throes of a very dry year with the potential of a disastrous wildfire. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Damien. Well, I, I would say that our, um, the way we work is largely based on innovation. We have to keep innovating every day. And this has a cost, obviously, it has a cost. So, in all senses. In all senses, exactly. I think we, we still have to, to work in order to find and design new and innovative and more adaptable um, models of public-private fundings related and associated, sorry, to um, environmental and performance criteria. That's really important if we want to go a step further in the fight against uh, climate change. As I said before, and I won't go into, into so much details, we have to work more collaboratively. Um, this is the only condition for, um, for the things to work. Um, and finally, we, ha we not only have to, to grant access to drinking water to women, um, but also we have to trust women, rely on them and empower them so that they be become the, the future leaders of uh, water services of tomorrow. Secretary Mjolla. Well, I'm convinced that to have better cities, cities are the opportunity where innovation, where things are being invented, being implemented, but without a doubt we need civil society, we need the academia, and we also obviously, on behalf of the government, have to work in a very integrated way to move forward with all these great challenges that we have in the city. Water is one of the main uh, vulnerabilities of Mexico City, as many other cities. So, but working together in an integrated manner and obviously taking women into consideration will make things happen and move much faster. I think we have to have a sense of urgency and how we move faster in implementing, um, well, the solutions. But cities are the opportunity for all the solutions and we will keep growing, we'll, we will keep having more demands energetically in water and services, but we are also a great opportunity to see best practices. So thank you, the three of you, very, very much, not only for being part of this panel, but for being part of this Women for Climate and everything you've, do, you're, you've been doing regarding this issue. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you